today's talk, and I'm very excited to introduce my new friend, David Ziba. I was just thinking, so I think we've known each other for six years, seven years. So, definitely way before we became professors at uh, in Simon Fraser in London. And um, when we, so actually when we met first, we were working very much on the same topics. At that point, we were both very much interested in thermodynamics of control. And there's something that people now call the um, Silver Crookes relation, which I have found that in the literature, um, which is a phenomenological theory that allows you to find optimal protocols for systems in which you want to minimize um, separation, in which you want to minimize dissipation into the environment. But ever since we've diverged a little bit, still working with the same kind of tools. But as many of my colleagues, he started thinking about um, biological systems, and I think he now considers himself a biophysicist, even though I still would call him a statistical physicist. Um, for about four years now, he has been at some Fraser, where he has a very, very productive, very vigorous research uh, program going on, thinking about the thermodynamics and the optimal control of biological systems. And I hope that this is what he will be talking about today. I'm very excited that you're here. The stage is all yours. Okay. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, thank you, everybody who I've met with today. Uh, it's been a really fun day. You guys have got a great uh, uh, critical mass of people here really doing great stuff, and I look forward to seeing the grad students um, afterwards. Um, so before I get started, I'll just uh, have a brief advertisement for my lovely campus. This is Simon Fraser University on top of Burnaby Mountain, looking out over the howling wilderness that is just beyond our campus. So Vancouver is kind of pretty. This is an aerial shot, admittedly, so this is not what it looks like from the ground. Uh, but the skiing is quite good there, so come on up sometime. My actual office is something somewhere like right about here. Okay, so I'll get right into it. So um, my research program is really, at the end of the day, motivated by basically the observation that there's this second law of thermodynamics, and boy, is it inconvenient for living things, right? So what does the second law say? The second law says that um, entropy in the universe increases over time, and uh, that's, that's, that's trouble for living things, right? So the universe has been around for several billion years at this point. So if you look out into the world, you would expect to see a very disordered environment, right? You would expect to see some sort of high entropy primordial soup, if you will, right? But at least in the biosphere, in this very narrow shell right at the edge of the Earth, you don't see that, right? You see, in fact, really stunning order among living things. You see incredibly orderly processes. And so at one level, I'm really interested in just the question of how is it that living things can essentially, you know, fight the second law or at least hold it to a draw and create and maintain order in the face of what we believe to be this sort of ineluctable progress towards more and more disorder. And at one level, there's no great mystery. We get this constant energy input from the sun and essentially living things siphon energy off of that energy flow and then use that energy to essentially beat back entropy and to create and maintain order. But what I'm really interested in is sort of how biology does that and how it does it well, right? How does it sort of make best use of those energy flows which it's subjected to um, uh, in order to essentially uh, fight the second law? And so I, I'm by no means the first person to talk about things this way, no less a physicist name check than Erwin Schrodinger uh, in his sort of novella, What is Life, which I highly recommend, uh, equated death with the decay into thermodynamical equilibrium. So in a very real and meaningful sense, to be at equilibrium is to be dead, okay? And so we really need to think about how is it that living things can avoid that fate. So the, the sort of more specific systems that I'm really interested in is essentially how living things avoid that fate. These are what I'll call molecular machines. So they're protein complexes that convert between different forms of energy. And you can really think of these as sort of machines to transform one non-equilibrium source of energy into some no other non-equilibrium source of energy. And so some of my favorite examples of these include transport motors. So some examples go by name like kinesin and myosin, the names aren't so important. But what these guys do is they transport cargoes um, that are often much bigger than these individual machines along essentially cytoskeletal highways. So essentially roads within every cell that allow them to sort of in a very directed fashion take cargoes to one place rather than another. So you can think of these guys as essentially converting a non-equilibrium distribution of reactant and product chemical molecules, which they burn, and they transform that into non-equilibrium distributions of material throughout the cell. 
Perhaps my favorite machine, which we'll talk in more detail about in a couple minutes, is the rotary ATP synthase. This is the complex that makes ATP, which is essentially the chemical fuel that everything else in life uses to drive otherwise unfavorable reactions. So what this guy does is this guy converts a non-equilibrium, uh, essentially voltage difference across a membrane into high energy chemical bonds, which are then sort of parceled out to the rest of life to do interesting things with. And so I like these machines for a variety of reasons. So first off, if you're writing a grant, you can have a nice little intro that points out that when they malfunction, people get sick. Um, if you care about biology just sort of on a fundamental level, essentially anything interesting in cell biology makes really fundamental use of these machines in its core um, functioning. Principles that we derive from these machines we think can be really of use in helping people design novel machines to do all kinds of new nanotechnological uh, applications. You can think of drug delivery, for example, as one thing these might be very good at. And finally, they're just really cool. And so I hope I can sort of impart some of that coolness to you over the next couple slides. So here's a movie, a very fanciful movie, that people have made of what these machines actually do. This is actually probably even a little bit too loud. Uh, I don't think I can easily turn that down. So we saw this machine walking along a little highway in the cell, dragging a cargo behind it. And it's a very inspiring movie, right? That's kind of cool. That's a nanometer scale object that's walking kind of like I might go walk my dog. Um, but when you actually look at what these machines do, this really isn't quantitatively how they behave. So what people can do is they can attach fluorescent probes to one of the feet of this walker and they can just monitor where it goes, right? And so along this axis is along one of these uh, filaments, one of these roads, highways through the cell, and this is sort of the transverse axis. So along, you know, not going anywhere in particular, but just kind of going along the transverse axis of the road. And what you see is that, first of all, it's a huge mess, right? This guy just kind of bounces around everywhere takes forward steps, side steps, backward steps, all kinds of interesting behavior within here, right? So we need to keep in mind that these things are fundamentally stochastic objects, right? So they're soft matter objects. They're immersed in a bath of water molecules that are continually pummeling them. And room temperature is essentially comparable. The energy scales of room temperature are comparable to the energies con to convert between different shapes of these molecules. So we really have to think about them as really fundamentally random objects, right? This is not like your car engine, right? Sometimes when you put your foot on the gas of one of these guys, they go backwards, right? And so you can imagine that sort of the design principles for them might be very different than for sort of macroscopic machines. So people make movies that are a little bit more faithful to look at these, and here's an example of one of these. So it's the same kind of process. It's a transport motor walking along a road. But we're now trying to capture some of this stochastic behavior of this motor, right? You've also got much more ominous music playing, right? So it's not quite as clearly a positive thing anymore. But really what I'm interested in my research is trying to sort of put some more quantitative meat on the bones of these kind of inspiring videos, right? And to try and capture the fundamentally random behavior of these guys in the kind of models we think about. So this is meant to really convince you that thermodynamics, right? Conventional thermodynamics that you learn in an undergrad class, which was developed really fundamentally at its, at its outset to understand the behavior of human-sized machines, in particular steam engines, might not be the best place to go to try to get a quantitative understanding of what these machines do, okay? So I'll try and summarize what I think are kind of the most salient facts about these molecular machines that we really have to incorporate into any understanding of how they behave. So the stylized facts as I see them is that they fundamentally have to be out of equilibrium, right? So if this guy is in equilibrium, it's as likely to take a step forward as backward. That's not very useful. This guy is as likely to burn these high energy chemical bonds as to make them. That doesn't sound very useful either, right? So they have to be driven out of equilibrium and they have to then in turn create sort of non-equilibrium stores of energy to really do anything useful. On the last slide, I tried to motivate the idea that they have very large fluctuations, so we really need to take that into account in their behavior. 
I won't spend much time on this, but the general idea, these are very small objects going at relatively slow speeds compared to, for example, human-sized machines. And so they're in what we know as the low Reynolds number regime, right? So there's no such thing as inertia for these. You can't rely on persistence of velocity to carry you through some steps of your cycle. Everything is over damp motion for these machines. And finally, these are, these are machines that are serving a biological purpose, so they have to go fast, right? They can't, you can't make appeals to sort of quasi-static limits to understand their behavior. Something like this ATP synthase has to click around at something like 6,000 RPM. So it's gotta really go fast, okay? And so we really need to think about what happens when these guys are operating very far from sort of the you know, slow limits where the math becomes easier and we can actually come up with simple expressions. Okay. So this idea of a strange new world where many of the rules don't seem to apply is something you guys are perhaps familiar with from recent past. Um, and so perhaps we can find some analogies between the, you know, the surprising outcome a couple months ago and, and this sort of world of molecular machines. So what my group is interested in is trying to understand what are sort of the design principles that govern the behavior, the, the, the energy transmission, the perhaps information transmission, which I won't talk as much about today, of these machines, what it looks like at the biomolecular scale. So the kind of questions we ask are things like, given that you have these molecular machines, they have to operate rapidly, they have a very large stochastic component to what they do, they have no significant inertia, um, and they operate very far from equilibrium. What does physics tell us about what are the limits on how well they can behave? when we sort of ask about what are the designs that actually achieve those limits? Do they have anything to do with what nature has actually evolved to solve these kind of problems? And finally, can we give any sort of insight to people who are designing novel machines um, to help them kind of make more functional um, synthetic nanomachines? Okay, and we have a little review from last year kind of laying out some of our ideas on this front. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about ATP synthase before we get into the actual sort of nitty gritty. Um, and so this guy is really just a totally incredible nano machine. So the basic idea here is this gray bar right here represents a membrane, so some lipid fatty component that segregates one compartment from another. Um, other machinery creates an imbalance of protons across that membrane, right? Basically by burning the food that you eat, you push protons across this membrane to create a really strong imbalance. And then this blue subunit here basically channels these protons down their gradient. So you can think of this as sort of running down a battery. And it couples that proton flow to rotation of what really is a nanometer scale crankshaft axle. This crankshaft, the rotation of this, in turn drives this red subunit to make ATP, which again is this chemical fuel which everything else uses to then um, drive forward in, uh, reactions that wouldn't occur otherwise. Okay, so you can really think of this as sort of a two-part machine, one of which converts uh, electrochemical gradients into mechanical rotation, and the other of which converts mechanical rotation into chemical synthesis of, of high free energy bonds. And so what's really great about this machine, there's many things that are great about it, but for our purposes, what you should know is that single molecule experimentalists can really interact with this in a way that looks an awful lot like how it actually behaves um, in living cells. So what you can do is you can take this subunit here, the one that makes ATP, you can immobilize it on some cover, lip, cover slip, attach a magnetic bead. This is not to scale, right? If this were to scale, this bead would be the size of this building. Um, but uh, attach this magnetic bead, you now have sort of a micron-sized object that you can interact with, um, and you can apply what's known as a magnetic trap, essentially setting up magnetic fields that impose a constraint on the orientation of this bead. And you can, for example, have some dynamic changing of this magnetic trap to force rotation of this bead. You can also monitor the spontaneous fluctuations of this bead. So you can both see the sort of equilibrium fluctuations of this guy, and you can also drive it in a way that looks an awful lot like how it's driven in real life. Okay, that's all I said there. So a couple questions that I want to pose in the context of this ingenious machine that makes ATP. So first off, if I'm this blue subunit here, which goes by the name of FO, don't ask, um, or if I'm an experimentalist driving this in some magnetic trap, what can I say about the schedule of rotating this crankshaft 
that's going to minimize the amount of work I need to put into it to get it to make a certain amount of ATP, right? I'd like to minimize the number of hydrogen ions I need to run down my gradient in order to make a given amount of ATP, right? I don't want to leak energy as much as possible. A second question I'll ask is if I take the perspective of this guy right here, right, there's some driving force represented by this voltage across this membrane that's available, available to me to make use of. How do I sort of interact with it? How do I couple to it? How do I distribute that proton motive force across the different steps of my conformational cycle, my different catalytic cycle, so that I can make best use of it, so I can maximize the flux of ATP molecules that I make? Okay, and as physicists, we, you know, kind of shrink from these very specific questions and try to phrase them more abstractly so we can get more general insights. So the two ways I want to state this, these two questions are, what can I say about the properties of driving protocols? I'll get more into a minute about what I mean about that. But uh, ways of driving a system that minimize the amount of work I need in order to accomplish them. And secondly, what can I say about allocating free energy that's available to do some useful purpose so I can maximize the flux of my machine. Okay? Any questions? I see at least one person who's peering in an unhappy way at my screen. Yeah. Okay. In a confused way, yeah. So we're not talking about the working machines. We're talking about the work. And you have to do conjunction between the work and the work. In this case, we're asking about the work I need to do to convince the red guy to make ATP, which could be work that I do as an experimentalist when I've isolated this guy and I'm now trying to perturb it magnetically, but it could be the work that this blue guy does on the red guy. Are we okay with that? Yeah. Um, what do you mean by machine flux? So what I mean is, this red guy, what is it doing? It is binding some precursor molecules. In this case, they go by the names of ADP and PI, these guys right here. Binding those, then getting mechanically pushed in some way that it creates a bond between them, and then it lets them diffuse away, and then it binds another ADP and PI, creates a covalent bond, lets them diffuse away. So it's going through this cyclic operation. And what I mean by machine flux, again, I'll get more in the details in you know 25 minutes when I cover this section, but basically I mean, how much progress can I get of that machine? How many of those ATPs can I make minus the number that I burn going the wrong way? Yeah? Any other questions? Yeah? Is this shape sort of universal, or does, does the shape of the lower red part vary a lot? It seems like that would influence the answer. So, yes. So, in our modeling, we're not going to get into sort of detailed molecular scale questions of, okay, which amino acid needs to be next to which. This particular molecule, it turns out, is really well conserved. Like, essentially, every living thing has a, a version of this. So, it's been around for quite a while, and many of the details are fixed. Oh, I'll just mention one sort of titillating little fact, which is that you can imagine. Um, well, I'll just say it has been observed that the number of subunits in this blue guy, so the number of sort of trivial pursuit pie pieces that are arranged in a rotational fashion to create one of these guys, varies from organism to organism. And it varies in a way that's correlated with the typical potential across that membrane, which suggests that over evolution, uh, the gearing ratio between these two guys has been adjusted to avoid any unnecessary loss of energy between the handoff. Mostly at an observational level. Whoa, is right. Yeah, exactly. Any other questions before we start getting into the actual things that I've done? We're okay? Okay, so the summary so far, molecular machines are totally weird and totally awesome, so we should all study them. Um, and single molecule experiments can probe their behavior, and so we have some hope of actually making contact with the experiment and actually saying something that's tethered to reality. Okay, so let's get into this first question. What can we say about the properties of what I'll call optimal non-equilibrium driving processes? And I'll unpack what I mean by that in the next slide or two. Okay. So how do we think about a system that's far from equilibrium? In this case, the way we're going to sort of operationalize that is we're going to say, okay, let's talk, let, let, let's talk about me as an experimentalist for a minute, not as a molecule because that's a little trippy, but you know, have that in the back of your mind. 
So I'm experimentalist, and I want to drive a system out of equilibrium. How do I do that? I have some knob that I can turn as an experimentalist, some dial that I can turn up or down to change the conditions, the constraints on the system, and thereby kind of get it to do something new, right? So examples of this might include this magnetic trap that I mentioned. What's the angle of this magnetic trap, right? If I change that, I'm going to change essentially the equilibrium ensemble of my system consistent with that particular value of the trap angle. Another example that I'll talk about uh, in a bit is if I have what's known as an optical trap, where instead of an angle, I'm imposing a particular extension, again, sort of nanometer scale extension uh, between uh, micron-sized beads that are generally, if something interesting is happening, attached to something interesting in the middle. So you could imagine the extension, the distance between the foci of that optical trap as being a control parameter under your experimental control that you can manipulate at will. Okay? And so if I'm at equilibrium, I just tell you the current value of the control parameter, and that specifies the ensemble of system states that are the equilibrium distribution under that constraint. But if I'm out of equilibrium, it means I've been changing the control parameter fast enough that the system is still kind of catching up with the changes that I've made, right? So what I want to do is I want to think about sort of a schedule of changing my control parameter where I start at some value and then I really hammer on the system. I change this control parameter very rapidly. Either I stretch my molecule very fast or I force it to rotate really fast. And I'm doing it fast enough the system is, is not able to respond fully. It's lagging behind and so it's driven out of equilibrium. And I'll refer to the sort of history of how I change that control parameter as the protocol that I'm driving the system with. Okay, and so if I have a lowercase lambda that describes my control parameter, then an uppercase lambda I'm going to use to describe the whole protocol driving the system. Um, and the question I want to pose is, let's say I want to change the control parameter value from some initial value, let's call it lambda A, to some final value, let's call it lambda B, though I didn't label it here. So here's one way I can do it. I can kind of go increasingly fast over time. Another way is I can go at some constant velocity. Here's a third way that's kind of the opposite. And these are kind of, in general, so my, my experiment that I propose is I do this protocol once and I measure the work as I'm driving my system. I measure the energy I need to put in. I repeat it again, I'm gonna get some different value because remember I've got a stochastic object that I'm shoving on, right? So I do it a bazillion times till I build up some distribution of how the system responds to how I'm driving it and I get some average work. And that average work is gonna differ between different schedules of changing this control parameter. And what I want is I want some way to estimate how much work I need to do to drive the system rapidly along one of these schedules and what's the schedule that's best in the sense that it requires the least work in order to do. Okay, are we okay with that basic idea? Yeah, okay. And I'm gonna focus on sort of the one dimensional case where I have one control parameter, but we can generalize this to many control parameters and then the problem becomes one of, you know, so if I can change the magnetic trap angle and say the strength of the magnetic trap, um, then it's not just what's my schedule along a given path, but what's my best path through control parameter space that minimizes the amount of energy I need to burn to make it happen. Okay, and so I'm gonna sort of skip to the math punchline because I wanna sort of spend the time unpacking it and seeing what its implications are rather than deriving it here. But basically, a near equilibrium relation, so if I'm not driving the system too fast out of equilibrium, we have a relationship between what I'll call the non-equilibrium excess power so power, it's a rate at which you're doing work. It's an excess power because it's the rate above the rate you'd be doing work if the system were at equilibrium all along your protocol, right? So that would be the rate at which you'd just be doing sort of the quasi-static work on your system. So this guy, so you know, if I integrate this over a protocol, I get the total work I had to put in um, to drive the system out of equilibrium. It's a product of two, fact, uh, two terms one of which is the square of d lambda dt, the rate at which you're changing this control parameter. And the second term is zeta, which I'm gonna unpack here. It's an integral of an autocorrelation function of some f's. These are the, do I unpack this here? I'll just tell you, these f's are the forces conjugate to the control parameter. So if I'm stretching my macromolecule between two optical beads, this is the tensile force it's resisting being stretched. Okay, so it's some, not too bad, but you know, maybe not familiar form of, of, a, of an equation of this autocorrelation function. 
You can break it up into two pieces which are more familiar. One of them is just the variance or the equilibrium fluctuations of that conjugate force. So what are sort of the tensile force fluctuations when I'm sitting at a fixed extension? And then this relaxation time, which tells me how quickly do my um, correlations decay in this system. And so the product of these two actually mathematically takes the form of friction. So what we have here, this zeta, is really a friction coefficient. Mathematically, it's entirely identical to sort of the friction you might be used to, but it's now a friction in a more generalized space, right? It's a friction in control parameter space. It's telling you about the system's resistance to rapidly changing this control parameter. Okay, but again, mathematically, it's exactly the same as sort of more familiar friction, and you can see that here. So here's my expression I just uh, threw at you guys. Here's something more familiar. If I'm dra dragging some object through viscous fluid, what's the rate at which I need to do work to do that? Well, it's the viscous force that's being, the motion's being resisted times the velocity I'm pushing through that fluid, right? And to uh, leading order, that viscous force is just the friction coefficient of the medium times the velocity that I'm pushing through it, right? So I have just entirely analogous expressions here. Some excess power is equal to the product of the square of a velocity times some friction coefficient, okay? So it's really entirely analogous. It's just in sort of a different space, right? These control parameters need not be sort of geometric coordinates of my system. Okay, why do we think this is cool? So it's a, it's a fundamentally non-equilibrium quality uh, quantity, this thing on the left, in terms of equilibrium quantities and things which you as an experimentalist impose on your system. Uh, it's local, I'll sort of skip that in the interest of time, but we do get a very simple expression that governs how to minimize the work along a protocol once we know what this friction coefficient is. Okay, so it tells you that where the friction coefficient is large, that's where you wanna push slowly because essentially the system is relaxing very slowly, you wanna give it more time to catch up. Where the friction coefficient is relatively small, that's where you can really plow ahead without incurring too much extra energetic costs. Okay, so an analogy for this, it's kind of like air travel in the sense that, you know, when you fly from, in this case, Vancouver to London, right, a significant fraction of the way across the globe, you don't take a straight line on a Mercator projection, right? What you do is you actually fly on what's known as a great circle route. Why do you do that? Well, the airline doesn't want to pay a lot for gas and it wants to get you there quickly, right? So it's trying to minimize the cost of gas and the time, which is pretty much proportional to how long it takes. And so um, you go along this great circle route that reflects the curvature of the globe, right? And so there's a very tight analogy here that essentially the minimum distance route for air travel is analogous to this minimum work protocol. The Mercator projection is kind of like whatever physical coordinates you originally used to describe your system, right? Which may not be the ones in which minimum work paths are simple. And finally, this relationship between latitude and curvature is really the analog of this force autocorrelation function that governs sort of the curvature of your space and therefore the curvature of your optimal paths. Okay, so we've, we've looked at we, and some others, including your illustrious host, have looked at calculating this friction coefficient, some of us call it different names, um, in some model systems. Essentially, these are all numerical or in a couple cases, analytic uh, calculations. I'm gonna skip those in the interest of moving to an experimental test of it, what to my knowledge is the first experimental test of kind of the utility of this framework. Okay, so this is work that was done in collaboration with Carlos Bustamante's group uh, in physics at Berkeley. Sarah did most of the experiments. Shishin started doing the experiments and then decided to become a professor and didn't really have time for that. And Steve, my grad student, basically designed the experiments and then did all the data analysis of the resulting data. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna basically test these ideas on the simplest biophysical system we could imagine which, sad to say, is not a molecular machine yet. Those are horribly complicated. But what we did was we took what's known as a DNA hairpin. So it's a sequence of DNA that is complementary to itself, such that it likes to coil up into something that at least somebody at one point thought looked like a hairpin, though, I don't know, most hairpins that I know don't look so much like that. But you've got, so you've got a self-complementary piece of DNA, single-stranded DNA, that likes to coil up into this shape. You've got double-stranded DNA on either side that makes it long enough that you can easily attach it to these micron-sized beads and then you've got optical traps that impose preferred extension on those beads. Okay, and so the experiment we're gonna do, 
is we're basically going to start at a short extension of this optical trap where the beads are relatively close together and the hairpin is preferring to be formed. And then we're gonna rapidly extend the extension between the uh, optical traps, thereby unfolding the hairpin, okay? So its preferred, ex its preferred shape is one that's unfolded, um, it, it increases its entropy, and energetically it's no longer favorable once you have these large extensions. So we're gonna do that, we're gonna wait a while, and we're gonna go right back and refold it, okay? And we're gonna basically look at the work under those different, protocol under those different uh, unfolding and folding protocols, and see what we get. <clears throat> are we okay? Okay. So, yeah, please. How are the DNA links connected to the little... Uh, there's biotin and striptavidin linkages. Sorry? It's like they're glued on. They're basically glued on. So there's some biochemistry that allows you to attach one part of a very sticky duo onto one end and one part, of the other part onto the beads. And then basically what you do is you, uh, you kind of put them into solution and you kind of drag the bead around until you start getting resistance. And you're like, oh, I've grabbed on, because of course the DNA is way too small to see, right? So the beads are visible in the microscope. The DNA, of course, is smaller than the wavelengths of light, right? So, yeah. So how do you connect on so what they do is they basically, once they, once they encounter some resistance, then they do some tests to make sure that there's only one that's connected, that's tethering the two between them. How big are the beads? How big are the beads? They're sort of roughly a micron in diameter. Maybe two. It's amazing they can do this, and I can't do this for sure, right? But it's amazing they can do this. They've been doing this for 20 years at this point, yeah, yeah. 25, okay. So, um, okay, so that's the experiment. So what do you actually see? So let's start with, so what we need to do the experiment and to sort of test the theory is we need to first figure out what this friction coefficient is for this bead optical trap system and then we need to sort of test smart protocols and not so smart protocols, right? So what we first do is we collect the equilibrium data on what this conjugate force is. Again, it's the tensile force that you observe by seeing how far the beads are pulled out of the focus of the optical trap. Okay, so if we sit at a very short extension between the beads, where the hairpin prefers to be folded, then we're gonna see it bouncing around without anything terribly interesting happening, right? It's just sitting in that folded state with some conformational fluctuations because it is soft matter at room temperature. If we go to the really long extension between the beads, where it prefers to be in the unfolded state, we see the same thing, just at a different force, okay? And if we go to what's known as the hopping regime, where it on equilibrium hops back and forth between folded and unfolded, then things get interesting, and we see that it sits in a particular state for a while, and then jumps up to the other state, back and forth, so kind of populating both the folded and the unfolded states, but with relatively long residence times in each of them. Okay, so we can take these traces, and we can just look at the distributions of them, just to get another way of looking at it, when we're in the folded ensemble, it just sits in one state, the folded state, with fluctuations around that preferred uh, extension and thereby the preferred force. Likewise for the unfolded, and in the hopping regime is where it bounces back and forth between these two. So you get this bimodal distribution, folded and unfolded. Okay, when we look at this force autocorrelation function, which is what we need to integrate to get this friction coefficient, it looks uh, pretty simple in the folded and unfolded cases. It has a relatively low force variance, right, because you're sitting in one basin so the force doesn't change that much, and it has a relatively fast relaxation time, right, because there's no big barrier you need to get over to relax within your equilibrium states. However, in the middle is where things get more interesting again. You have a relatively high force variance, right, because you have two metastable states that differ significantly in their force, and you have a long relaxation time because you have to jump over that barrier, okay? So we take this force autocorrelation function, we kind of plot it as a function of the fixed extension when we just sit at a fixed extension, and indeed it's peaked in the middle, as I tried to suggest on that previous slide. We look at this relaxation time, it's also peaked in the middle. We take the product of the two, which is this friction coefficient, and it's peaked in the middle, as, as we expect. Okay, so now we remember our formula for how to relate this friction coefficient profile to this minimum work purportedly minimum work protocol. So the naive protocol is just proceeding at a constant velocity, right? This is velocity versus extension. And the designed protocol is gonna go very fast, 
then very slow right around this hopping regime, and then very fast. Okay, so we can just translate this into just a, a, a protocol uh, map that says what's our separation as a function of time. Okay, so constant velocity, fast, slow, fast. Okay, so the analogy I like to think of for this one is it's kind of like if you were bi biking over a hill in a tornado, in the sense that what is this design protocol saying you should do? It's saying basically that you want to go slow near this barrier between your two metastable states because you're basically going to give thermal fluctuations as much time as possible to kind of kick you over that barrier for free, right? So you don't have to push the system over that barrier and do work. And so the analogy is that if you're biking in a tornado, right, and occasionally some big gust of wind knocks you forward or backward, you actually want to go slower near the top of that hill because maybe some gust of wind is going to kick you over that hill and you don't have to put in the leg power for it yourself. Okay? Okay, so let's now do these smart protocols and the less smart protocols and see if we see a difference in what happens, okay? So during the what I'll call the naive cycle, we unfold the system, right? So we are extending it. The force ramps up and up and up until the molecule unfolds. That's characterized by this rip where it drops to a lower force, right? Because it's now a greater, the, the molecule is now longer, can accommodate um, a greater extension. And then the force just increases till we reach the end. We wait a while and then we come back and it refolds at a different force, right? It's a stochastic object. Each time it's gonna be somewhat different. And in general, that force is lower than the force at which it unfolded. This is basically the hysteresis, right? This is the irreversibility of the system, okay? If you were doing this infinitely slowly, those would happen at exactly the same force, okay? We do exactly the same thing for our design protocols. And as this schematic is meant to imply, they generally unfold uh, at a lower force and refold at a higher force. So closer to equilibrium. When we actually look more quantitatively at this, here I have plotted the essentially the fraction of the excess work normalized by the naive excess work as a function of where it happens along your protocol. What you see is that indeed the naive protocols have the work really peaked in the middle where you really are pushing this thing over the hill, right? Whereas what the design protocols do is they kind of distribute the work more evenly over the whole protocol, right? Because you're going really fast and then really slow where the system is lagging the most. And also the area under the curve ends up being less. And here we have going from top to bottom, a relatively slow protocol down to a relatively fast one that's in this case 16 times faster than the, than the slow protocol. So when we quantify the actual cycle work, Right, we, quant we, we measure the work just F times D integrated that curve going forward and then going backward, it's gonna be a negative work that we recover, right? We add those two together and then if it's greater than zero, then that's the sort of work that's lost due to this hysteresis. We can see the distributions for the design cycles and the naive cycles and the naive cycle cycles are generally shifted to a higher value of the cycle work and so a greater hysteresis. Okay, so we can then just look at the means just to kind of see everything on one plot. And we've plotted as a function of protocol time, the cycle work for both the naive cycles and the design cycles in green. And what we see is that over a factor of, you know, 32 in speed, um, we are consistently and statistically significantly saving work by doing these design cycles, okay? So we're now at these fastest protocols, very far from equilibrium. We're using a near equilibrium theory, but it's still at least giving us sort of qualitative guidance about how to save energy in the system. Oh, no, it's just that's what I was wondering. Yeah. You, you know, you're from equilibrium, but on the other hand, it's kind of like being a, in a phase transition where you've got like a lot of fluctuations are really strong. Kind of That's kind of a big meatball to swallow, but uh, what I would say is that basically linear response, and Sebastian will back me up on this, works surprisingly well when you might not expect it to work. But this is not necessarily saying that it quantitatively works, this is saying that at least qualitatively it saves us energy compared to what we would do if we didn't know any better. Okay, so this is one hairpin that I showed you. We lifted another hairpin that we redesigned to have essentially a stickier stem so that it's a higher barrier for it to get over to unfold. So essentially it relaxes at a rate about 100 times slower than this hairpin that I showed you in detail. And we see exactly the same kind of trend here. We can't go to these fastest times because it never refolds. It's actually so slow that we just don't even see that. So we can't really compare it there. <coughs> 
Okay, so what are the implications of this, right? I made all this, you know, song and dance about molecular machines, and then presto changeo, I talked about DNA hairpins, so it'd at least be nice to know what do we think the ramifications of this are for molecular machines. Okay, so let's think about this F1, this subunit that makes ATP, right? And so if we think about what does its energy profile roughly look like, it's a, it's a set of metastable rotational states separated by barriers, right? Because if we monitor its spontaneous fluctuations, it just kind of bounces back and forth between roughly 120 degree steps. So we have a set of metastable rotational states separated by barriers, and we can ask what is the protocol, the rotational protocol that would minimize the work we need to put into this guy, right? So I kind of flip this so I can put the y-axis as the crankshaft axle, and the x-axis is the time, and the prediction is that you want to basically, again, go fast, then slow, then fast, where you're going slow near the hopping regime where the F1 is at its transition state, basically, right? So the problem with this, right, is that FO, the motor that ostensibly is driving F1, right, this blue part that has to drive this crankshaft axle to perturb F1, it itself is a soft matter object that is stochastically fluctuating, right? So how do we think about a stochastic driving protocol? And we have a preprint available on that, but um, the basic punchline of that is that basically what you want to do is you want to counterpose the metastable states of FO, the driver, out of phase with the metastable states of F1, the thing that's being driven. So essentially what FO is doing is it itself is kind of stochastically crossing barriers and then sitting at points that correspond to the hopping regime of F1, right? And so this is then a sort of stochastic mechanism by which you can minimize the work that you need to put in to F1 to get it to make ATP. Okay, so we're thinking about a number of extensions of this theory um, that I really won't get into in the interest of time, but there are some interesting ways you can make this even more faithful for biological systems. But the punchline from this so we have theory that predicts ways to drive a system at minimum work. We have found that it systematically saves you energy when you're both unfolding and refolding DNA hairpins, which are sort of our hydrogen atom of biophysics. And we argue that it has some implications for how you would want to sort of couple the components of a molecular machine to sort of avoid lost work in the sort of energy handoff. And so there's sort of the initial theory paper, and there's the bioarchive preprint. This is in review right now. Um, as my host, should I, can I take 10 more minutes, or should I stop? Yeah? Okay. Okay, so let me tell you, this story is much quicker, so it really won't take very long. This is the second piece. So the previous story was basically saying, I'm trying to shove on some system to get it to do something. How do I do that? energetically efficiently, this is now saying, I'm some system, I'm facing some fluctuating environment, how do I sort of interact with that environment well so that I can make best use of the, the uh, biased fluctuations that are present in that environment because it's out of equilibrium. And this is all work done by my former postdoc, Aiden, uh, and detailed in these uh, two papers. So let's go back to these molecular machines. Um, and let's think about um, how people typically represent their, their dynamics and perhaps the most uh, uh, popular way that people go about doing this is by a small number of sort of discrete states representing different conformations of these machines um, separated by, you know, kinetic transitions between them, right? So people have built discrete state models of ATP synthase, kinase and myosin, and many others. And the basic intuition, right, is that the machine operates in a complete cycle coming back to sort of the same point when the machine is restored to its original uh, state, but the environment has been changed, right? So a cycle of ATP synthase would run some number of protons down the gradient and synthesize, in this case, three ATP because it's got a threefold rotational symmetry for the red subunit. Okay, so we're gonna basically look at these discrete state models and we're gonna pose the following question. So, in this case, we're gonna think about the simplest possible machine cycle we could imagine, a two-state model, right? There's two distinct metastable states of this machine, and we can have forward progress represented in green here, where it's going the way around its cycle that it wants to, that's sort of functional, and we can have backward progress uh, represented by these red back arrows. And it's a fundamental fact of statistical physics that the ratio of these two rates are related to the dissipation along that pathway. This is a condition known as generalized detailed balance. So 
uh, the ratio of the forward and the backward rate along a given path is related to the dissipation sigma ij along that transition, okay? So we're gonna make use of that constraint. We are gonna operationalize it in a way that I call forward labile rates. We've actually looked at the opposite extreme of this and things in between, and the results are independent of that, but I wanna focus on one example to be concrete. And we're gonna pose the following question. Let's say that the free energy driving this cycle is constant, right? So let's say I have a machine that's trying to burn ATP to transport uh, cargo throughout the cell, right? So the free energy hydrolysis of ATP is something that is set by other actors outside of yourself. So that's relatively fixed. In the cell, it's something like 20 kT. So I have a fixed total dissipation, but what's not fixed is its allocation across this step, this step, and if I have a multi-state cycle, the other steps of my cycle. So what I want to do is I want to ask, how do I allocate this free energy driving force across the different steps of my cycle so I can maximize the flux through that path, through the cycle? So I can maximize the amount of probability that's driven in the green direction minus the amount that's driven in the red direction. Okay? Okay. So a lot of people have asked similar questions before. They've typically uh, had slightly different constraints or they've had slightly different criteria of optimality. But everyone has concluded, that we could find, has concluded that the best way to allocate this free energy driving is to have equal amounts, sort of an equal drop per step of your uh, reaction cycle, which is somewhat intuitive, right? You have sort of a waterfall picture and you don't want some parts to be steeper than others. Okay. We don't find that, but we'll get into that in a second. So again, we go back to our simplest possible machine cycle, a two-state model. <clears throat> and what we find, doing the math, it's not terribly complicated, is that the optimal allocation, the one that maximizes the flux through this cycle for a given um, free energy drop, is equal to one term that I'll call the naive allocation, right? Uh, if you don't know any better, you would just put half of it on each, which is what these other people claim is the way to go. But there's a second term here which says that um, uh, you want to decrease the allocation that you put on a given step when its bare rate, when its rate in the absence of any non-equilibrium driving is relatively low, right? So the sort of intuition here is you want your sort of non-equilibrium dynamics, you want your allocation of dissipation to sort of compensate for slow equilibrium dynamics, right? So you want to basically mate the sort of non-equilibrium driven rates to be similar. We can ask this for three states, cycles. In the interest of time, I will skip this. The conclusions are really the same. We can ask about how sensitive is the flux to this optimal allocation. And the answer is that we can off be off by you know, a couple, two, three, four kT, and we'll actually drop off by a factor of about 100 in the flux. So it seems like this is actually a relatively sensitive function of these allocations, um, and so this is something that biology might actually care about, right? It's all well and good to say it's optimal, but if it's not a sensitive function, then who cares? But we're finding that it actually is a sensitive function. We can look at that in the three-state cycle. Again, I'll sort of skip this in the interest of time. So why do we get a different result than essentially everyone else who had looked at sort of related problems? And so we found that the, the sufficient conditions for our result are that we need to have a nonlinear relationship between the dissipation and the kinetic rates, right? So you can do like a linear approximation of this, which is what other people had done. And if you do that, then you don't get this uh, uneven allocation. What we are doing is we are optimizing flux and we're essentially assuming a fixed efficiency, right? So we're not looking at the case where the sort of coupling between mechanics and chemistry in this case <clears throat> is uh, more complicated. We're sort of looking at kind of the base case where that's already fixed. Um, the constraint that we're imposing is that we're fixing the dissipation per cycle, right? Other people had fixed the dissipation rate, but for us, we think physiologically, it's much more relevant that you have a fixed, you know, en free energy available due to hydrolysis of one of these ATP molecules, rather than to say that you have fixed the total number that you consume per um, time. And then really sort of the key for our intuition is this idea that you have to take into account the fact that at equilibrium, the time scales for the different reactions in your process are going to differ generally quite, quite significantly, right? So if all of the equilibrium rates are the same, nothing terribly interesting pops out. But when you actually look at what happens in real systems, you can see many orders of magnitude disparities in these equilibrium time scales. So um, 
you can see evidence of this. So I'll start with one qualitative argument, which is that when you look at these discrete state models, that are basically the encapsulation of experimental evidence into our understanding of how these machines work. You see a mixture of what I've highlighted in red, which are quote unquote irreversible steps, and then the other steps which are reversible that have arrows going in both, react in both uh, directions. But what we know is we know that microscopically there's no such thing as an irreversible reaction, right? If you can have molecularly some go forward, you can obviously just turn around the arrow of time and, and, and have it go the other way. It's a possible reaction, right? So when we say something is irreversible, what we really mean is that the back reaction is so slow that we never observe it, and so we can't really estimate the rates, right? But given this condition of generalized detail balance, what this is telling us is it's telling us that if we see the forward reaction but we never see the back one, that's telling us that we have a big dissipation on that reaction step, right? And if we combine that with the fact that we have reversible steps, that means those don't have a lot of dissipation on them because we can witness both the forward and the backward rates. And so this kind of prima facie tells us that we have a wide disparity in the dissipation among the different steps. You can do this more quantitatively. You basically need Michaelis-Menten kinetics, which you guys don't do biophysics, so you might never have heard of, um, but some of you have. Um, so it's not available in a database, but we can sort of pull individual papers, the data from them, and then consolidate them. And what we find is that, so the dotted line is the total dissipation available to a particular enzymatic reaction. The black is the experimental fit using these discrete state models. The blue is the prediction from our uh, theory, and the red is the even allocation that many other people have predicted. And what you find is that for some enzymes, your actual allocation is very different from an even one, this guy, this guy, and this guy, and our predictions are pretty much spot on. Uh, and for some of them, the al optimal allocation is actually relatively even because the rates are not so different. And so I'll skip that in the interest of time. We've talked about this in the context of a single molecule cycle, like an enzyme or a, um, a molecular machine. But formally, you could apply this to like metabolic cycles of reactants. There's nothing to stop you from doing that. So we're thinking about that as well. So summary of this part, um, flux is generally not optimized by evenly allocating your dissipation across the steps. Um, it is a sensitive function of that allocation, and so it really drops off quite steeply away from that optimal allocation. And we have at least some initial evidence that actual evolved systems are much better described by this kind of a framework than by one that says you should evenly allocate your dissipation. So finally, let's acknowledge the people that I've worked with over the last few years in red are the people involved in these projects. Always good to acknowledge funding sources, and I'll just show you my group real, group real briefly. Um, and just to mention that uh, you know undergrads are a strongly fluctuating quantity, and so these guys will be gone by the end of the summer. So we definitely have room for sort of undergraduate summer opportunities, uh, as well as graduate student positions as well. So if you're interested in any of this, come come talk to me. Okay, thanks for your time. How do you measure the force in the experiments with the beads? Yeah. So the basic idea is, so what your optical trap does is it induces essentially a potential that pretty closely near the trap looks like a harmonic potential, right? And so you can actually, um, you can monitor the position of the beads in that optical trap. You know where the focus is. And so their distance out of that trap, the center is just linearly related to the force that they must be experiencing and due to Newton's third law, therefore, you know, the force that the, that the guy is pulling back on them. Yeah? So second question yeah. So is the memory that we put was down in the, in the solution or anything? It's in solution. So these, these DNA constructs are in water, and the beads are attached to the ends of them in water, and the, yeah. Right, so in that way, in that sense, if you drive it like a, a, a quicker, yeah. does, does the resistance in the liquid to do something, uh, when you drive, when you drive it at a different velocity, um, so in the, exper excuse me, in the experiment, we're not distinguishing between what the source of resistance is. So you could think of it as sort of the need to break the bonds in the hairpin. You could think of it as viscous friction from the fluid around it. You could think of it as all kinds of things. And we don't have a way of directly getting at that. All we know is that we're trying to make it unfolded and this is the resistance we get, right? And so it's good to keep in mind that, you know, in living things, there's a lot of water. Now, it's often crowded, so there's often other things that are nearby it, but generally speaking, it's in a liquid environment-ish environment. Yeah. 
Yeah. Constant in nature, you said it was 6,000 RPM. Yeah. 100 uh, rotations yeah. per second. Yeah. Constant about 10 milliseconds. How do you reconcile that with the somewhat slower time constant you measured in your experiments? Um, you're saying that we never do a protocol that's 10 milliseconds. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. I mean, so we 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 cannot get that fast. Okay. Um, currently, I mean, th is, this is already like I should say like the fastest single molecule f unfolding folding that's ever been done to my knowledge, right? Because just no one, why would you want to go that fast when you're ever, you're going to mess up everything basically? But yeah. But but are they applicable when you, when you study the fundamental processes? Uh, yeah. Can you justify those processes? <sighs> so I mean, I guess one thing I would say is that. The, the, the disparity by a factor of whatever 10 in the, in the pulling speeds between our fastest and what we think it's actually doing is probably the least of the discrepancies between our experiment and what we're, I mean, this was a DNA hairpin, right? Which is like one molecule that's basically two state, and we're gonna claim that these findings apply to these horrible things that have 10,000 atoms and are, you know, 100 times the size and have more than two stable states. So I would say, Yes, it, it, it's, we would love to be able to push up to those rates as well. One question just is, you know, even at these rates, this is horribly out of equilibrium. And sort of one of the motivations of all this work that I didn't really mention is that there are some indications that these machines are really efficient, right? So there have been measurements that have said this guy is like 90% efficient. But all those experiments are done essentially at like stall torques where this guy is very near equilibrium. And so what we have no idea about is how efficient is it out of equilibrium at the speeds it actually operates and even like what could it do even, you know, theoretically, right? So our hope is that this gives us a way to at least estimate, to see how well this, you know, procedure of estimation works when we're approaching the time scales that we think this guy actually behaves at. But you're right, we're, we're absolutely not there yet, but I mean, there's also several other disconnects between what we claim to be proposing to this. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I was enthralled by the two little video clips at the very beginning. That's why I show them, yeah. Show them. Yeah. And I was wondering two things. One is, you mentioned that the first one really is not connected to reality. Well, I mean, they're both fanciful videos, but, but yeah. The second, how close is that to reality? I mean, is it just some fanciful thought, or... Is it actually You're saying, for example, the jitter that we see, how does that correspond with the... In any way related to what reality really is, or is it just sort of... I would say it's a little bit closer, but I don't... So, I don't know the provenance of the videos in terms of, like, the tightness of the discussion between the artists and the scientists who are involved in it. I, I don't, like, you know, I, I just am a consumer of the videos like you, and I just say... <sighs> I want to do that. Um, so I don't know. My guess is, so often it's a question of sort of time scales, right? Like the finer the time scale you resolve these things, the more jittery they're going to. It's kind of like the England coastline problem, right? But uh, um, if anyone doesn't know what that is, we can talk about that afterwards. Um, uh, so as you go to finer and finer time scales, it's going to look more and more jittery, right? And so. Can I, can I make consistent that video with that intervening picture I showed you of the fluorescence positions over time? That fluorescence one looks a lot noisier to my eye than that, than that video. So I think probably it's still not even capturing the true noisiness of this system. It's more just meant to be like, hey, guys, remember that this thing doesn't just go do, 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 do. This guy is like whipping around all the time. And so I think it is much more like a hurricane than it is like, kind of like, oh, well, it's a little noisy, but you know. Yeah. So that representation. Mm -hmm. So how far and how fast is it? Does it travel along? Does it actually travel at? What are the speeds that it travels at? So. Okay, so so the steps that this guy takes, that's relatively well known because it actually, it can't just kind of glom on anywhere. There's like regular spacing. It's eight nanometers for that particular example molecule are the step sizes that it takes. Um, I think you're talking about probably something like 10 to 100 uh, hertz in terms of the rates at which it's taking steps. Um, that would be my kind of ballpark guess, but 
don't hold me to that. I'm being videotaped. This is going out live. Shoot. Um, yeah. Uh, and, oh, and so it's cheering along. Yeah. It had to get from A to B. Yeah, that's right. So, so, so what we know about it, we know that its net motion is in the right direction, right. but we know that layered on top of that is a very large random component, right? And so it is biased statistics, but it's not ballistic motion, right? You have an idea, some ideas to how fast it does move down the track with all the jitters. I mean, again, it's, it's you know, again, I'm, I'm kind of like digging into the, you know, my, my hazy recollection of this, and I think it's something like 10 to 100 hertz in terms of the number of forward steps it takes overall. So, right, so, you know, overall, it, it, it'll take 100 forward steps in a second or 10 uh, forward steps in a second net. But there's an advantage to those forward steps because you just There can be. There can be, sometimes. Uh, in terms of jiggling uh, into an optimal situation, right? Uh, there certainly can be, yeah. But I mean, that jiggling also is sometimes counterproductive. Sometimes it blows you off the thing altogether, and so, and sometimes yeah. Sometimes, if you're not quite doing the right thing, yeah. you have a little jiggling in the system, it will allow you to lock on. Yeah. Think, yeah. Uh, like yeah. Stochastic. Yeah. Yeah. So there would be an advantage then for the systems. Now some kind of randomness then that could be it could be advantageous, and there's certainly many examples of biology making use of randomness. I don't know in this particular case whether someone has told that kind of story. I mean, that would be very dependent on what the temperature was, right? And so, you know, you could imagine well, that it could be way too hot or, you know, not quite hot enough to get the effect you're seeing, but it certainly could be. So yeah, I, I mostly I portray this as, oh, stochastic is really complicated. How, how, can, how do we have any hope of doing anything with it? But it's certainly true that Biology does make use of stochastic effects in many contexts. I'm just wondering, like, yeah. if you only have one directed path in which something can happen, that's not necessarily a good thing in biology. Well, if your goal is to take it down that one path, then yes, it is, yeah. It would be more easily broken inside. Maybe, so maybe there's a robustness story you can tell. Yeah, that's possible, yeah. Sorry, not one last question. You mentioned in West Life, so if this machine doesn't function well, it's yeah. going to be uh, some disease or some yeah. What kind of things will happen with this? Um, so what I know better is I know from the transport motors, um, so some of these guys that are transport motors, they also are, cousins of them are also the things that create your muscle contractions, for example. So things like cardiomyopathy, so like your heart doesn't work because your muscle contractions either are not strong enough or not well-timed or something like that. So that's one example that I know that's a pretty widespread um, problem of this. The, the ATP synthases have an interesting behavior. They seem to be really involved in cell death for some reason that no one quite understands that they, um, they, they have some interesting behavior. They kind of all glom together and then that's like a precursor of the cell saying, I've had it, I'm out of here. Um, but whether that's just a mediating thing or whether that's kind of the signal that makes it happen, I don't know that there's an answer for that. And often cell death is a good thing, right? Because if your cell is doing unpleasant things, maybe you want it to die rather than to poison everything around it or go cancerous or whatever. So the cardiomyopathy is the one that I know is, is quite well established for a lot of these, uh, for myosin in particular, yeah? Thank you. Okay, thank you.